People told themselves their past with stories, explained their present with stories, foretold the future with stories. The best place by the fire was kept for the storyteller. The following true story of the famous diabolic possession in Alsace of two boys which began in 1865 is compiled from original documents by Abbe Paul Sutter of the Diocese of Strasbourg. I first heard of this story from a Mr. John Venari in a talk he gave on the Sacred Heart and the French Revolution. And then I came across it two other times reading through the works of Father Dennis Fahey principally the secret societies and the kingship of Christ. Father Fahey also quotes from this possession in his book, The Mystical Body of Christ and the Reorganization of Society, as well as in other works of his. The main quote that the demon speaks through one of the boys is, Long live liberty, equality, fraternity. That is the favorable time for us. This shows Satan's high opinion of the principles of the French Revolution. I do want to thank one of my subscribers, Barbara, who assisted me in researching this topic and finding an English translation of it. Uh, You can actually purchase the small book. It's called Lucifer uh, or the true story of the famous diabolic possession in Alsace. Now, let's go to the story. Preface. There are many able men and women who refuse to believe in the existence of the devil. They think it a fable, and for those who believe in it, they have only ridicule or pity. Yet these very people will readily accept what reason admits as possible and what history attests as true. This is not the place to give proofs for the existence of the devil or of spirits good or evil. Suffice it to say that reason admits that such beings are possible. Faith teaches that they really exist, and the history of the human race confirms the teachings of faith. Even the scope of modern spiritism, apart from its many deceptions, seems to show that there is a spirit world. Wicked spirits can exist just as wicked men can exist, and if they exist, they can do us harm if God permits them. The little book, Lucifer, translated from Abbe Sutter's original Aslatian documents by Father Bohr, is an authentic record of diabolical possession, of injury done to two innocent children by the devil. Should this little book come into the hands of the unbeliever, his first impulse will be, perhaps, to smile superliciously, and even ridicule those who believe in it, or pity them as weak-minded and the slaves of prejudice. Let him read this book, and he will find that at least it furnishes evidence that any court of law would admit as proof that something very unnatural happened in the case of these two children. Unless the existence of the devil and his power to injure people be admitted, how can what happened to those two Ilford children be explained? Since the Great War, Spiritism has become for many a sort of popular creed, Apart from its many deceptions, it cannot be denied that it tends to, and often establishes, contact with evil spirits, having sad consequences for many of those who engage in it. It enfeebles the intellect and will, and for some the result is insanity, for others, suicide. All thoughtful men and women should unite in opposing a practice that has brought such sad consequences to many of its innocent dupes. If the incidents related in the book Lucifer will help as a warning to its readers and their friends against having any dealings with spiritism, it will do a useful work, and Father Borer will have conferred a benefit on his English readers by his translation of it. Lucifer, Introduction On the subject or the existence of evil spiritual beings or devils, The teaching of the Catholic Church is clear and emphatic. The Church teaches that there are bodiless spiritual beings, 
having intellect, and therefore personality, and created by God in a state of sanctifying grace. They were destined by him to great glory in heaven. The Almighty, however, gives no one a crown without its having been previously merited by effort. For he also that striveth for the mastery is not crowned except he strive lawfully. From 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. He subjected all angels to a trial in order to make them deserve as a reward the everlasting happiness. A great number, however, failed in this test of fidelity. They desired, rather, to rival God himself, and their pride caused them to lose the sanctifying grace of the Holy Spirit. Their sin was a voluntary rebellion against the Almighty, an actual breaking away of them as created beings from God their Creator. It was, moreover, a sin committed by beings of intellects immensely greater than those of any human beings. For the mental energy and willpower of those pure spiritual creatures, angels, not only enabled them to adhere irrevocably to their purposes, but left them devoid of any excuse of ignorance or weakness. Their sin, then, was of unmixed malice and without possibility of repentance. They immediately thereupon became rejected by God. Their spiritual life faded away in the darkening of their intellects and the hardening of their wills. They lost eternal happiness, and their punishment was hell. For God spared not the angels that sinned, but delivered them, drawn down by infernal ropes to the lower hell, until torments to be reserved unto judgment. From 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. These malignant spirits are our enemies. They are jealous of us human creatures who, according to St. Thomas, are destined one day to fill their place in heaven. Unable to prevail against the power of God, they seek to draw men into temptation and sin with the purpose of separating them from their Maker, both in time and in eternity. They began their nefarious work with their first parents by inciting them to disobey God. This first sin brought Adam and Eve and all their descendants, with the sole exception of Christ's mother, into the power and bondage of Satan until Christ the Savior appeared in this world to destroy, by his atonement on the cross, the work of the hellish foe, to break his power and to restore spiritual freedom to fallen mankind. Thereafter, it became possible for man to overcome, with the help of divine grace, all temptations of the seducer, and to obtain eternal happiness in heaven. Belief in evil spirits is as old and widespread as humanity itself. Even heathens believe in their existence. The misguided pagan imagination, it is true, disfigured the primal truth, and their fears led them to render divine honors to the evil geniuses. The Old Testament, again, often mentions the spirits of hell with their baleful influence in this world and warns men against their malice. Foremost in our mind is the story of patient Job with the dreadful calamities which Satan was allowed to bring upon the head of that great sufferer. When Christ appeared on earth, the belief in the devil's existence and harmful influence was general amongst the Jews. Our Lord and his apostles confirmed that belief by word and by deed. They taught the means of resisting bad spirits, and also they themselves expelled those beings from the bodies of people suffering from diabolical possession. The Catholic Church, the pillar and ground of truth, acts in the same way. She teaches the fact of the existence of fallen angels. She protects the faithful with appropriate spiritual weapons, the signs of the cross, holy water, etc., She has her own formula of exorcism against diabolic possession. She invests her priests with the power of destroying the might of Satan and of expelling him from possessed bodies. In his inscrutable designs, God allows evil spirits to hurt and frustrate human activities with persistent interference. At times, they will injure men in their worldly goods, as witness the cases of Holy Job, St. Anthony the Hermit, St. Teresa, 
the cure of Ars, Maria of Mori, Crescentia of Kofferborin, etc. This is what is called, in theological language, obsessio. It even happens at times that Satan is allowed to penetrate into a human body, to unite himself with it, and to exercise a real control over its senses, limbs, and organs. This mysterious indwelling enables him to use for his own purposes the senses of his victim, to confuse the spiritual actions of the soul, and to produce in this way most strange and wonderful effects. Possessio. The marks of true possession are as follows. Number one, knowledge of foreign languages never studied before. Number two, scientific insight. Striking ability in solving scientific problems by persons without education. Number three, knowledge of distant, secret things, penetration into the thoughts of others. Number four, exhibition of strength far above what is human or natural. Number five, the quote-unquote binding, suspension of the power of bodily organs, resulting in blindness, deafness, muteness. Both Bible and church history relate the frequency of possession in times past. Often Christ freed men from evil spirits. He drove out many devils and forbade them to speak. As we saw in the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 1, verse 34. And the devils left many, saying, Thou art the Son of God. The Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 4, verse 41. Well known is the case of the two possessed men of Gerasa, found in the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 8, verse 31, and that of the possessed boy at the foot of Mount Tabor, found in the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 9, verse 33. The power of exorcism was left by Christ to the apostles. In the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 10, verse 1, and the church confirming the teaching of the apostolic fathers and the doctors in all times, proves her power over possessed men by the fact of exorcism or adjuration, also known as a solemn command to Satan in the name of Christ and his holy mother Mary, to quit the bodies of possessed persons or to abstain from acts of enmity against men. The church has a special cons consecrated clerical order, order Exhortatus, or the order of exorcist, whose task it is to expel the devil from unfortunate victims. Subsequent to the death of Christ on the cross, possession is of rare occurrence in Christian countries. Among the heathens, however, it is even nowadays fairly frequent according to the experience of our missionaries. It does happen, however, though rarely, that the Almighty allows the foe to dwell in a human body and to subject it to all kinds of disorders. Many people are still alive who have witnessed the case of the two boys of Ilford and Alsace, and who can establish the actuality of the events affecting those children. Such awful things can never be forgotten. We have authentic documents written by eye and ear witnesses who, as experts, have thoroughly investigated the case. They help us to throw the light of fact on the most tragic yet most interesting story of the suffering of these two little Ilford citizens. The documents are found partly in the archives of the parish, partly in the papers of the ex-mayor and deputy, Ignace Spies of Celeste, and in the writings of Professor Lachman. Both these gentlemen having investigated the case most thoroughly and most conscientiously. The Reverend Rector Hussar, who is still alive and who was in those days chaplain of St. Charles and Monsignor André of Ribevaux, who had charge of the elder boy in the final weeks of his affliction, have also left documentary records of their impressions, which have helped us in our task. A series of articles in the Revue Catholique of Alsace of the year 1870 and a brief history of the case of Abbey Bray, the parish priests of, Ilbor, of Ilford, have also been consulted. Chapter 1. Thibault and Joseph Berner. 
In the village of Ilford, five miles south of Mulhouse, in Alsace, dwelt a poor but respectable family named Berner. Joseph Berner, the father, was a traveling merchant who sold matches and tinder. The mother, Mary Ann Paltzer, looked carefully after her five little children. Their eldest son, Tybo, was born on August 21, 1855, and the second, Joseph, on April 29, 1857. When eight years old, they went to the elementary school. They were quiet boys, somewhat delicate, and of an average intelligence. In autumn 1864, they were both visited by a mysterious malady. Dr. Levy of Alkirk, who was first called upon to diagnose the case, as well as other doctors who were consulted afterwards, were unable to explain the sickness. The remedies prescribed by them had no effect. Tybo became thin as a wandering shadow. From September 25, 1865, the boys displayed most abnormal phenomena. What's lying on their backs, they span round in circles, like tops, with great rapidity. Then they began to belabor their bedstead and other furniture with astonishing strength and persistence. Never were they tired with their heavy exertions, however long they th the thrashing lasted. They had fits of convulsions, and at times such prostrations as to lie down for hours, like corpses, motionless. It often happened that when sitting on their wooden chairs, the boys, and also the chairs, were lifted up into the air. And then the boys were thrown into one corner, but the chairs were flung into another. At other times, they felt all over their bodies a painful pricking and stinging, and then they pulled out from beneath their clothes such a great quantity of feathers and seaweed as to cover therewith the whole floor. Frequent change of clothing did nothing in the matter. Always there appeared feathers and seaweed, and these feathers, which covered their bodies so mysteriously, gave out a frightful stench which made it necessary to destroy them. Strange to say, when they were burnt, they left no ashes behind. Their dreadful convulsions and other sufferings of every kind forced the poor victims to remain in bed with swollen bodies. If perchance an object blessed by the church, such as a crucifix, sacred metal, or rosary, was shown to them, they flew into a frenzy of rage. They prayed no more. The names of Jesus, Mary, Holy Spirit, pronounced by those who approached them, made them quake and tremble. Spectres, seen by them only, filled them with terror. Fear came likewise over the poor parents, who were obliged helplessly to witness these horrible scenes. Neighbors marveled. Visitors from near and far became more numerous. Everybody wanted to see the poor children. What had happened to them? There lived at Ilford an old woman of bad repute, who had been expelled from her own native village on account of her profligacy. It, it is related that from her the two boys had received apples, which they had eaten. This is said to have been the origin of their strange illness, even according as afterwards transpired to the testimony of the evil spirit, spiritual beings thus possessing the bodies of the boys. However this may be, assured facts were soon to prove what kind of power was the origin of the phenomena, for the tree is known by its fruits. Often the children lay for hours in motionless apathy, then suddenly their whole being changed. They became nervous and excited and gesticulated and shouted incessantly. Their voices were, however, not those of children, but the strong, rough, coarse ones of men. Their mouths were then mostly closed, and it was evident that they had nothing to do with such language and screams, and that invisible beings were speaking through their mouths. For hours they would scream without ceasing, using such meaningless phrases as paste threads, paste knots, watercress. The horrible scenes almost forced the onlookers to take to their heels, and the poor parents knew not whence to seek help. Most striking was the fear of the children for articles blessed by the church. Equally great was their antagonism to church, prayer, and religion. Dreadful were their blasphemies, 
as in their filthy language. They used a vocabulary unknown to them in their normal state. They likewise spoke and answered fluently in different languages, French, Latin, English. Even the most varied dialects of French and Spanish were known to them. No wonder that everyone wanted to see the unfortunate children, and that church and state took an interest in them and investigated their case most thoroughly. Foremost among the sympathizers with the unhappy Burner family and its two pitiful children was the parish priest of the village, the Abbe Bray, a noble and God-fearing priest. His mind was quickly made up as to the diabolic origin of the phenomena. It was a real case of possession. He could not otherwise explain rationally what was taking place. The ecclesiastical authority was communicated with, and a committee of inquiry, consisting of three theologians, was appointed for the purpose of officially investigating the case and of taking in hand, later on, the task of exorcism. The Abbe Bray was strongly supported by the mayor and the best families of the village. Skeptics were, of course, still to be found, but their number was small. From them, the hellish spirits showed sympathy, whereas they hated those who saw through their nature. A special object of their aversion were the parish priests and the mayor. They also showed great hatred for Monsignor Ignace Spies, the mayor of Celestat, his friend Martineau, director of Reger of the same town, and for Professor Lachman, a friar de Marais of St. Uh, Hippolyte. These three gentlemen had come from a distance to study the case in its minutest details. Chapter 2. The Devil Each boy was infested by at least two bad spirits. These concealed their names as long as they could, but Father Suquat forced them in Christ's name to reveal their identity. Oribas and Ipes were raging in the elder boy, Taibo. Ipes called himself a hellish chieftain, ruling over 71 legions. One of the spirits who haunted the younger boy, Joseph, named himself Solalathiel. The name of Joseph's other tormentor, unfortunately, cannot be remembered. This Solalathiel surpassed in cunning and cruelty the devils of Taibo. Ipes was struck with deafness for so long as he dominated the, his hapless victim. The latter had completely lost the sense of hearing, so as not to be in the least affected, even by pistols being fired in the closest proximity to his ears. He recovered this sense only when delivered from his foe. The evil spirits had their own superiors and masters, before whom they trembled. They received occasional calls from them, which were not welcome. Now comes the master was once the terrified cry of one of the boys. What master? he was asked. Our chief. Is he stronger than you? Oh, yes. What is his appearance? He has two feet, a body covered with feathers, a long neck, and a beak like a duck's. His hands resemble the claws of a cat. Hold him when he comes cried an onlooker. On this, the boy shouted, Here he is, here he is. With the quote-unquote master came other spirits, his lieutenants. There are many of us, then exclaimed the possessed boy. At times, this great chief appeared in the form of a wild man, of a dog, or also of a serpent. Chapter 3. Saints and Holy Objects The diabolical nature of the malady, which was afflicting the boys, revealed itself especially when the latter were brought into proximity to holy water or medals or rosaries, which had been blessed according to the ritual. Then the indwelling spirits caused the boys to rage, to froth at the mouth, and to struggle with the utmost energy to avoid coming in contact with with such article. 
food, mingled with some drops of holy water. They would never touch, although the fact of mixing was unknown to them. Away with this filthy stuff, they would cry. It is poisoned. To endeavors at forcibly feeding, they would oppose frantic resistance, aiming blows right and left and clenching their teeth immovably. Food, unmixed with any holy water, however, they would accept and devour eagerly. A strange fact, however, was that it was necessary to induce them to eat their food by putting it into their mouths with three fingers. Because the evil spirit had once declared, quote, with a little dog, meaning the boy, eats with his left hand, or with only two fingers of his right, belongs to me and not to him. A neighbor, Madame Brobeck, had secretly put some holy water into their medicine. We would rather take all the vials of the druggist than the slightest taste of this filth, cried the possessed boy. On another occasion, they were presented with figs, which had been previously blessed according to the ecclesiastical form. Away with the ratheads! The priest has made grimaces over them, shouted one of the boys. On one occasion, Monsignor Spes held before the eyes of one of the boys a small relic of St. Gerard Mejia and said, Look, this saint has put to flight many of thy tribe. Immediately, the boy grimaced, puffed his cheeks, and held his lips tight, tightly closed. Just then, the relic was pressed onto his lips. The boy resisted with all his strength, whirled round, and behaved like a man in despair. At last, he cried out, Clear out, you Italian. Gerard Maia was indeed a young Italian redemptorist brother who had died in the odor of sanctity. The possessed boy had no natural means of knowing this. What the satanic spirit dreaded most was the blessed medal of St. Benedict. For that reason, almost every parishioner of Ilford endeavored to obtain one and carry it on his person. Once Monsignor Tresh was reading from a prayer book in the presence of the boys. He was interrupted by them. It is not necessary, they exclaimed, for you to come here to speak of the pious on the cross and of the great lady. In these terms, they referred to our blessed Lord and his holy mother. They displayed a most awful dread of the blessed Virgin Mary. One day... Monsignor Tresch put a medal of Our Lady of Perpetual Succor into the ear of the deaf boy and ordered the satanic spirit to depart. The child exclaimed, I cannot. Behold yonder, sulfur, resin, and pitch. When the nursing sister brought him something to eat and to drink, after having secretly mingled with it some holy water, the boy refused the food, or, as a rule, he would fling the dish or the glass, against the wall, but without breaking them. On such an occasion, a young man of the village came into the room and approached Tybo's bed. The possessed boy looked at him and said, Yes, eating and drinking and leading a bad life. This is thy way to heaven. The terrified youth scampered away. Before Monsignor Tresh left the boy, he sprinkled the bed with holy water pronouncing the formula prescribed in the ritual. Sit nomen domini benedictum. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Non sit, groaned the satanic spirit in the possessed boy. One day, a priest put a blessed medal on the ear of one of the boys whilst he was asleep. Suddenly, the ear began to shake until the medal had fallen away. The same thing happened when the medal was placed on the head. When the boy succeeded in hiding away any blessed article, he would grin and say, Look now for thy filthy thing. It is stinking. Towards priests, the satanic spirit was always full of hatred, pouring upon them the grossest insults and most opprobrious epithets such as might be learnt from the edifying talk of the most extreme and fanatical partisans of the enemies of religion. 
black cows, skunks, sorcerers. These were amongst the less violent of the names. He honored with a special derision, Monsignor La Superior Stumpf. I am going now to harass Stumpfel, the stinkpot, he cried on one occasion, adding after a while, I have played a fine trick on him, if only I had been able to do him in. When asked about the incident, Monsignor Le Superior stated that at that very moment, he was lifted into the air by an invisible force, that all his pictures were flung from the wall, that his furniture was moved and thrown about, and that uncanny phenomena appeared in his room until he sprinkled everything with holy water and commanded the hellish spirits in God's name to leave him in peace. This statement was confirmed by the satanic spirit itself. Stumpful, said he, Stumpful, the miserable, has barred me from the entrance by smearing his room all over with filth. The satanic entity had much greater sympathy for members of Jewish and Freemasonic sects. They are good people, he said sometimes. All ought to be what they are. They go in for true liberty. They save our master a lot of trouble and gain many people for him. The dung beetles, this epithet referred to the Catholics. The dung beetles, however, and the black cows, the clergy. The black cows do him much damage and snatch many souls from him. The satanic spirit displayed a passionate hatred of the clerical and of the religious habit. He flew from the very touch of either, whereas he had no objection to being covered by a layman with his overcoat or other garment. Once the spirit, speaking through his unhappy boy victim, said to Monsignor Tress, When you go to the pigsty, the church, and lift up your hands and blubber, pray, your destiny is above, pointing towards the sky, whereas those who do not follow you come to us. A lady visitor from, from Bettendorf put one day, which the boy's hands were tightly clasped, a blessed rosary on his breast. He shouted furiously, If I can get hold of those balls, beads, I'll tear to pieces the cat tail chain that is connected to the rosary beads. But I must not touch the image of the great lady, the Blessed Virgin, which is suspended from it. What, he was asked, is engraved on the metal? A boy and a girl protected by the great lady, he replied. On inquiry, the metal in question was found to be one of La Salette representing the appearance of the Blessed Virgin to the two children of La Salette. A lay, pertinent, a lay person who witnessed this scene repeated devoutly the liturgical prayer, From the snares of the devil deliver us, O Jesus. Upon hearing this sound of supplication, the possessed boy flew into an appalling rage. Be silent, he cried. Thou art lying. Shut up. On the occasion of a Corpus Christi procession, the behavior of the diabolic spirit was simply unutterable. One of the afflicted boys was taken into a house in front of which the Blessed Sacrament altar was set up. The diabolic entity caused him to shout, bluster, and rave in such a way that the appalling scene became unendurable. He only calmed himself when the procession was over. Similar incidents took place, although in a lesser degree, whenever the poor children were brought into contact with a crucifix, a rosary, or any other blessed object. It was always the same dread, the same horror, the same blasphemies, the same fury. It all proves the astonishing power and effects of the sacramentals, which, in the hands of faithful Christians, are an excellent weapon against the tax and temptations of the hellish foe.
Chapter 4, Satan and the Mother of Christ Was the fallen angel insulted and be mocked everything holy, not even accepting God himself? He never had the courage of assailing Mary, the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ. As for the reason of such surprising behavior, he always answered, I cannot do it. The pie on the tree, the diabolic spirit's extraordinary name for Christ, has forbidden it. He always referred to the Blessed Virgin as the Great Lady. During a momentary calm, the boy Taibo was given a framed picture of Our Lady, and he played harmlessly with it. Suddenly, there came a crisis. With all his strength, he flung the picture to the floor, where it was smashed to pieces. Professor Lachman, of Fer de Marie, who happened to be there, put to him the following question in Latin, whilst others forced the boy to be quiet. What thinkest thou concerning the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary, who has crushed thy head? In a paroxysm of rage, the diabolic being caused the possessed boy groaningly to reply, Get away! Go away! Go away with your great lady. I want to know nothing about her. Then he began to curse and blaspheme in so monstrous a way that the nursing sister, who was also present, was inexpressibly terrified. She made the sign of the cross with holy water three times upon the boy's forehead, mouth, and breast, mentioning at the same time the name of the Blessed Trinity. This was sufficient to bring back the patient to a quiet composure. Let it be remarked here that, at the instance of the parish priest, Abbe Bray, two religious sisters from Nirobron, Sister Severa and Sister Methula, watched and nursed both children without respite. Very difficult was their task. Horrible was their experience. To what innumerable frightful things they had to listen. In his conversation with Monsignor Tretch, the possessed boy repeatedly mentioned the great lady, whom he keeps at home in a shrine. But you have never seen her, answered the mayor. Yet I know, exclaimed the boy, that you give everything to the great lady and to her dog, thus blasphemously alluding to Christ. You carry her always in your pocket. But why do you call them such awful names? asked the good Christian. I cannot, replied the possessed boy, do otherwise. One day, Monsignor Spice and Martineau, accompanied by Monsignor Tretch, entered the house of the possessed children. The latter had seen them coming down the road, and the sight had very much irritated them. They were scarcely in the room when little Joseph opened the conversation with Monsignor Tretch. You have sent a letter to Splits, a nickname for Monsignor Spez. Another such name was Kinesi. And this man here, referring to Martineau, has come with you. I have not written, assured the mayor. You have, persisted the boy, and the other one accompanied him. This was indeed a fact. Then both boys began to tremble, and Thibault shouted in French, Liberté, Égalité, Fraternité, République Française. The coming republic seemed more agreeable to the possessing entity than did, than did the then existing empire. Monsignor Spes took the little Joseph on his knees and questioned him on various subjects. Sometimes the answers were correct. Often also, however, he would say, You have no right to know that. Mention was likewise made of things concerning which the dark prince disliked to speak. What? The evil spirit was asked, Have you done with Voltaire since he came down to you? Ah, was the reply. We received him with great pomp. We went in procession to meet him but we held him fast. When he approached the gate of hell, 
He got frightened and looked as though he wanted to retrace his steps. But he could not escape us, and we forced him to enter the fire holder. While still holding the children on his knees, Monsignor Spez placed on the back of the head of one of them a piece of silk, which the child could neither see nor even feel. On a sudden, the boy exclaimed, Put this rag away, it burns me. And he tried to rid himself of his visitor. But it is not a rag, answered Monsignor Spes. I will take it from you, if you will tell me what is on it. Take it from me, it burns me, replied the possessed boy. I shall not remove it, responded Monsignor Spes, so long as you do not tell me what is on it, no matter how much you gesticulate. The great lady is on it, exclaimed the boy, in tones of terror. And indeed, it really was a picture of Our Lady painted on silk. Again, the boy cried in beseeching accents, Throw away what you carry in your pocket, it burns me. He meant the little crucifix which the deputy had had with him, and of the presence of which the boy had no natural means of knowing. There are relics in it, he said, and it was a fact. Even the medals Monsignor Spes carried around his neck annoyed him, and he said, burned him. Chapter 5. Loss of Heaven, Pain of Hell The thoughts of having lost heaven forever made Satan inexpressibly unhappy. On several occasions, through the mouths of the two afflicted boys, the evil spirit sighed. How beautiful it is there above, how beautiful. Oh, if only it were granted to me to see again that glory, how happy I should be. Another time he said, What a beauty there is in heaven. Could I only be allowed to see it once, but no, never shall I see it again. Why do you manifest such an ardent longing? asked Monsignor Tresh. I am, he declared enigmatically, forced to do so by the three who are stronger than me. After Tybo had been conveyed to St. Charles Institute at Schlickenheim, he remained quiet and silent for the first three days. In the evening of the fourth day, the devil again showed itself in him. I am here, he exclaimed suddenly, and I am in a rage. The nursing sisters then asked him who he was. I am, he replied, a prince of darkness. Where, the sister continued, is thy home? In hell. Would you like to go to heaven? Oh, yes, cried the possessing demon. But there is no hope of admission. Who has expelled you, the sister asked, from heaven? Michael, cried the infuriated fiend. Michael the stinker, with his sword. What would you be prepared to do to go to heaven? I'd crawl, replied the spirit, for a thousand years on points of needles and the slide of keenly sharpened knives. He added that he was a hellish chieftain commanding a legion of devils in the air, the immense number of which would obscure the light of the sun, and they had bodies like men. The teaching of the Catholic Church as to hell the spirit declared, is true. But hellfire, he added, is far above what you can conceive it to be. It is beyond your power of comprehension. It is, its heat is greater and more active. It causes indescribable agony. Then the evil demon almost invariably expressed the wish that he could be annihilated by Almighty God. Once he was asked for information as to the language spoken in hell, Then, with great bombast and uncanny rapidity, the boy, under the influence of the possessing spirit, came out with a jargon which sounded like a mixture of Italian and Latin, with the often recurring and clearly distinguishable word, Victoria. That, he continued, speaking now in German, is the language spoken there. Where there? interrupted Monsignor Tresch. In hell? 
Yes, in hell. In the evening of March 28th, the possessed boy described the passion of Christ. Mentioning the agony in the garden, he suddenly exclaimed, Indeed thou art hot, frightfully hot. Thou art bathed in sweat for the sins of men. The evil spirit likewise acknowledged his presence at the crucifixion of Christ, where he incited the Jews to torture our Lord, and counted all the blows that fell upon him. A visitor then asked, What does hell look like? Not nice, he answered. On further queries being put, he became impatient and said, This is no business of yours. Try to get there, and you'll know by personal experience. Now and then, the satanic spirit endeavored to make some little propaganda for himself. To a visitor, he offered a daily bribe of 100 francs to enter his service. Even poor Berner, the head of the terrorized family, was asked to serve him for the sum of a thousand francs. To Monsignor Tresch, he said one day, I possess many sackfuls of gold and silver, and I will help you to find them. All right, replied Monsignor Tresch. I am pleased to hear it. I shall give the treasure partly to the church and partly to the poor. No, no, the fiendish being caused the boy to shout. That is not what I mean. Does not all this sound almost like the voice of Christ's tempter in the desert? All these will I give thee, if falling down thou wilt adore me? This proud and most unhappy spirit of darkness has no greater longing than to see all men pressed into his service. Chapter 6 Satan and Rowdy Amusements, Balls and Dances The possessed boys had frequently intervals, and even whole days of relative tranquility. The evil spirits were then absent from them, and the children would eat, drink, talk, and play, just like their comrades. They remembered nothing of the dreadful happenings during the possession. As a rule, his satanic majesty gave himself leave of absence on Sunday afternoons. When, at the beginning of a subsequent crisis, he was asked where he had been, he replied, in such and such a neighborhood village, at the annual fair, fine doings there. I have, he would continue, played them grand tricks and reaped an abundant harvest. This is my greatest pleasure, and I take delight in stirring up passions and in encouraging wicked amusements of young people. At St. Charles Institute, he once said, I want a drink. Monsignor Andre thereupon said, Thou canst not drink, thou art a spirit. What beverage canst thou wish for? Clear out here, and go back to hell. The devilish being replied, I sit down with drinkers, and incite them to excessive indulgence until they get drunk. In this state of stupidity, they spill some liquor on the table or floor, and that waste is mine. The demon declared furthermore his liking for balls and dances, since, at such functions, he had ample opportunities of tempting young people there into snares and fooleries. After this conversation with Monsignor Andre, the spirit left the body of the possessed boy. Ten minutes later, he returned and said with malignant laughter, I have just come from the beer house. Speaking under the influence of the possessing demon, the boy spoke of a certain public house and its proprietor, as well as of other inns and innkeepers at Schlingtenheim, although he had never been in that village before. Then he said, I am doing well and can rejoice. My master will be pleased with me. It happens only too often, alas, that in such houses the language is ambiguous and obscene. Then the demoniac spirit was in his element. Nothing gave him greater joy. One day, some half-drunken lads were disputing angrily what's passing the institute. Wait, the evil spirit suddenly cried. I'm going to get up a good fight. Five minutes later, 
Furious blows were raining on the youths, and the row was repeated three times. Meanwhile, the possessed boy was laughing heartily. One day, the spirit suddenly interrupted the babble of the afflicted boy and shouted, Silence! We have got him! Whom have you caught? he was asked. The demon replied, The young man who was dancing at the public house in Celestat. Now we have him. He shouted, Now he is with us. Immediately, inquiries proved that at the same hour and place that had been named by the demon, a young man, whilst dancing, had been seized with an apoplectic fit and fallen dead on the floor. When at Ilford, the spirit one day said, This blockhead of so-and-so and his wife have gone to the pigsty for a feed. The demon meant they had gone to church to communion. They were, he continued, hungry. Scarcely had they come home that they began to quarrel and curse in a mad frenzy, the most appalling blasphemies coming from them like snowflakes. It was a treat to me. I laughed in perfect delight. In the evening, they could have again gone back to the Schwinzenstall, for their state was worse than in the morning. I have placed all their curses in a small box where I keep them. Blasphemies, cursing, quarreling, objectional feasts, dances, balls. All these the satanic spirit praises beyond measure.